Three years ago, I uploaded a video beating Pokemon Fire Red following the official strategy guide as closely as possible, and people seemed to enjoy it. Since then, I've received comments about doing a similar thing with a guide from GameFAQs, which is a website that has a lot of tips and tricks on various games that's all user submitted. GameFAQs was more popular in the late 90s and early 2000s since it was one of the few gaming guide websites out there at the time, but now there's tons more and most people just go on YouTube to look up how to do something in a video game if they get stuck. Today though, we're gonna party like it's 1999 and go back to visit one of the first guides for Pokemon Red and Blue on GameFAQs by a user named Marshmallow. It was submitted in July 1999 and isn't the oldest guide on the site, but after skimming a few other guides on GameFAQs, I picked this one and you'll see why soon enough. I'll leave a link to the guide in the description if you want to see it in its entirety. So now let's try to beat Pokemon Blue with this guide. The very first lines of the guide open up by saying, as Jeff CJCVZ, owner slash webmaster of GameFAQs, opens up this file, he groans in agony as he must put yet another FAQ for the crack-like Game Boy game Pokemon. He thinks to himself, geez, there are already 30 FAQs for this game, why did that nutcase make another? They then go on to say that they don't know why they're making another Pokemon guide because there's so many on GameFAQs already, although most, quote, suck cheese. Beneath that, there is a note saying, Note, I recommend reading my walkthroughs even if you beat the game, as it offers very different strategies when compared to other FAQs. Originality is hard to find these days. I wonder what this user would think about YouTube today, but then the god gets even more sassier, and they decide to talk about the Pokemon television show, which is absolutely awesome. Pretty darn original, hard to find these days, and it has Pokemon. It was customary for these guides to have an FAQ section at the start, hence the name GameFAQs, I guess, with one question even asking to explain what Pokemon is and having a very funny and sassy response. And then they go on to break down red and blue in general, the version differences, and even talk about the Japanese exclusive green version, and even yellow version which wasn't released outside of Japan yet, as well as gold and silver which wasn't even out in Japan at this time. They go on to talk about some of the spin-off Pokemon games like Pokemon Snap by saying, All 151 Pokemon are not in this. Only about 130. Cheap. I really wonder how they would feel about the whole Pokemon Sword and Shield National Dex controversy from a few years ago. There's a lot of funny quotes from this intro and FAQ section, but I'll finish it off with this question. How do I move the truck near the SSN with strength? You can't. It was a pointless rumor. About Mew, I believe. Now at the time, we can look back and know that that was a very obvious rumor that everyone knows about, but back then there were people who legitimately believed it. I definitely recommend reading the rest of this guide after watching this video, but for now, let's get into the actual game. The guide starts off by saying it was written as if we picked Bulbasaur or Squirtle as our starter, as they are the easiest starters to use in the game, so we'll match what the guide writer picked and just pick Squirtle as well, which we'll name subscribe once we actually get to pick it up, and I'm sure you can tell why. The first line of the walkthrough portion says, Are you surprised that I'm making all of this fancy stuff as if it was a huge and complicated game? Well, I am too. But if it needs to be in a 100KB plus FAQ, then I say it fits the bill of complicated. 100KB is practically nothing by today's standards, as a picture taken on your phone will most likely take up 5 times or more the amount of storage as an 100KB text file. Although, again, to put things into perspective, 100 kilobytes in the 90s was a lot more than it is today. It then tells us to go to the PC, which stands for Pokemon Computer, to get the potion, then go outside and into the grass to talk to Dr. Oak, then go back to his lab, where you and your friend Gary, or whatever you choose, I'll use Gary throughout this walkthrough because that is his official name, will be given three Pokeballs, each filled with a Pokemon. Here, you get to pick the one that will change the difficulty of the entire game. Now, Gary's not technically his official name, but back in 1999, nobody really knew what his official name was in the games anyway. I noticed that this guide, and nearly every other old guide, had some different terminology for Pokemon than we would use today. For example, they call types elements most of the time, and a lot of special attacks, elemental attacks. Going back and reading a guide from when Pokemon was a pretty new game is a really weird experience. For Route 1, it just explains how routes work and have wild Pokemon, and sometimes have trainers to fight, and how we should skip most encounters unless we're trying to catch all 150 Pokemon. It tells us to level up our starter Pokemon until so we learn our first attack, and then go get a potion from this guy over here. In Viridian City, it tells us to find Dr. Oak's package, then explains how Pokemon centers and marts work since they are the first ones we encounter. 
Now we can return back to Pallet Town, and I just wanted to highlight how organized this guide is, despite having no pictures and being very limited. Most sections start off by showing off all the available Pokemon in the area and what items you can get as well, and then it's followed by a description of what to do in every location. For our return trip to Pallet Town, it tells us to deliver the package to Dr. Oak, get the Pokedex as a reward, and search everywhere if we want to complete the Pokedex, and go to Gary's house to get a town map from his sister. The town map shows a map of the entire world, or country, or island, whatever it is. One question, however, remains in my mind. Why is it called a town map? Lousy translating, I suppose. I want to also point out that at this time, it really wasn't clear what the name of the region in red and blue was, so people didn't know it was just called Kanto until a little later on. The guide doesn't really say much else until we reach Viridian Forest with this amazing paragraph. Before leaving, catch a Pikachu. You don't think it's too important? Let me say it again. Catch a Pikachu. It will make your life easier in the long run. There. Now I made it important by putting it in ever annoying caps. Pikachu is very rare in both red and blue, which means you may be here for a while, and trust me, I was. He appears most frequently in the long grassy areas near the north end of the forest. Once you see him, I suggest using the Pokeball is a Master Ball trick, which can be found in the secret section. In fact, I recommend using it all the time. Once you get Pikachu, train him hard, because he is quite weak when you first get him. I suggest level 20 or above. Exit to the next area. I scrolled down to the secret section to see what this Master Ball trick was all about, and all it said was, when you throw a Pokeball and the ball is on screen, hold B and up, then let go as soon as the Pokemon disappears into the ball. If you did this correctly, the ball will be as powerful as the next powerful Pokeball. Example, Pokeball equals Great Ball, Great Ball equals Ultra Ball. If you do this with an Ultra Ball, your chances are greatly increased. Note that nothing will act like a Master Ball, but when done with an Ultra Ball, when the enemy's HP is almost gone, it will have a 99%. This is useful against Legendary Birds and Mewtwo, though they should be asleep or frozen beforehand. Now, none of these Pokeball tricks have ever been true, and I just love that this is in the guide because people actually believe this back in the day, and I haven't believed this up until like Diamond and Pearl. There's always rumors like this say, hey, if you hold A or mash A or mash B or hold the left trigger, you'll get a Pokemon every time. It doesn't work like that. Once in Viridian City, we are told to head right to Brock's gym and fight against his flunkies. Then for Brock, it says, this guy is pretty tame. You shouldn't have much trouble. If you choose Squirtle, use Water Gun for a one-hit KO. If you got Bulbasaur, use Vine Whip for the same effect. Since rock types are allergic to water and grass attacks, meaning they die almost instantly from their element attacks. However, if you got Charmander, you're in trouble. Because rocks are highly resistant to fire, Pikachu doesn't help at all here. So your best bet is to get a Butterfree, evolved from a Metapod found in Viridian Forest, or a high-end Caterpie slash Weedle. Still, it will be tough. I told you, Charmander made the game hard, smiley face. I did go back to get a strong Metapod just to evolve into a Butterfree later on just in case, but Squirtle made this gym pretty easy, although I only had Bubble at this point and I wasn't a high enough level for Water Gun just yet. It tells Teach Bide, the TM that Brock gave us to our starter Pokemon since it probably has the most HP too, and I did it anyway although in my opinion Bide really isn't a great move. Now for Route 3. This is your first true test of patience. You have to walk through and fight at least 15 different trainers who give tons of EXP and cash. This is the best place to build up Pikachu as he should be very weak. By the time you get to the cave, he should be level 17 plus. Before going to the mountain, you can find a Poke Center conveniently located at the mouth of the cave. Inside, you will find a man in black who will sell you a Magikarp for $500. Most FAQs label this as a ripoff, but buy it. Magikarp may be the weakest Pokemon in the game, but he evolves at level 20 to the powerful Gyarados, which is in the top 10 Pokemon, not to mention my personal favorite. Remember, use the Building Weak Pokemon strategy I outlined in the FAQ section. The main reason for buying him now is because you won't be able to get a Magikarp until quite some time. On another note, am I the only one who renames it to Magic Crap? Probably not. There is a bit of grinding here where Metapod evolves into Butterfree, but I like that it at least gives us an idea on what level we should be at each section of the game, and suggests we buy a Magikarp, which I totally agree with. Magikarp is just a funny fish Pokemon, and Gyarados is really cool and one of my favorites as well, so why not get it when you have the first opportunity to get it? This then takes us into Mount Moon. This cave system is quite long, has many items, trainers, and is also the first area where you meet Team Rocket, a company that uses Pokemon for evil deeds. What? You didn't think that there would be such a thing? 
If you're looking for another good Pokemon, get Geodude. He evolves into the best rock Pokemon in the game, so this is a good choice. However, you have to find a way to equally advance Squirtle, Pikachu, Magikarp, and now Geodude. Quite a task. Put the Magikarp at the top, then switch to Pikachu to fight the baddies. For Geodude, let him fight against the trainers. Also, of note, you will encounter Zubats very much, when Pikachu's electrical attack can kill them in one hit. That's why Pikachu should fight the regular baddies. Squirtle should already have Water Gun, and Mega Punch isn't all that useful, so just throw them away in the PC. At the end, you will get to choose between two fossils. It really doesn't make much of a difference in the end, so go hog wild. Hee <laughs> hee, I said hog. I don't really understand what's so funny about the word hog. But many points throughout the guide, the secret leveling up technique is just to lead with your weak Pokemon and then switch into a stronger Pokemon so they both get EXP, which I'm sure everyone watching this video has done at least one point when playing through a Pokemon game. The guide really likes Magikarp, and to be honest, if I was old enough to be able to write a guide like this in the late 90s, I probably would have wrote a very similar guide too. I did end up catching Geodude, spent a ton of time training Magikarp, evolved Squirtle to War Turtle, and took our fossil Pokemon to make it to Route 4, where we can get the Whirlwind TM, but the guide says birds are practically useless in the long term, so ignore them. Now that we're in Cerulean City, the first thing we need to do here is fight Misty. As her name implies, Misty uses water-based Pokemon. The only Pokemon you've picked up that has a definite advantage over water should be Pikachu. Unfortunately, he's so weak at the start that Bubble Beam from a Starmie will kill it in one hit. Therefore, you must have a level 20 plus Pikachu if you want him to survive. Plus, if he is any less, his lightning still won't kill them right away. A good way to start is to use Thunder Wave to paralyze them, then keep hitting them with lightning. If you're real desperate, use Bide, especially if you chose Squirtle, since War Turtle vs Starmie is in Starmie's favor unless War Turtle has Bide. If you chose Bulbasaur, Ivysaur will have a little trouble against these Credence. However, the next few gym leaders will be near impossible for your little plant, so keep that in mind. If you chose Charmander, you screwed yourself, smiley face. I forgot to Thunder Wave her Starmie with Pikachu, but Pikachu was level 21 and allowed us to defeat Misty really easily at the Bulbeam TM, which the guide was very excited for and suggests we teach it to our War Turtle. Our team is also the exact team the guide recommends, plus this random Butterfree that I might just replace soon. Now for the rival fight before the Nugget Bridge. For Pidgeotto, just use Pikachu's Lightning. Abra is pathetic because he just uses Teleport and it doesn't even work, so you can destroy him. Rattata is also easy, and his starter Pokemon. For Bulbasaur, use Pikachu's Quick Attack, and for War Turtle, use Pikachu's Lightning. Pretty simple. For the Nugget Bridge in Routes 24 and 25, it's just to catch the planned Pokemon in our game, so in our case, Bellsprout, to continue to switch train Magikarp till it evolves into Gyarados level 20, and possibly catch an Abra to replace our most worthless Pokemon with. I did go out of my way to get this Abra to replace Butterfree, and it took a very long time because it kept teleporting away, which was quite annoying. After we save Bill, we go back to Cerulean City, fight Team Rocket, get the Dig TM for our Geodude, then go south to deposit our Geodude into the daycare and go into Route 6. This leads us to Vermilion City, where the guide says to get the Bike Voucher, get the Fishing Rod, although we can only fish up Magikarps for right now, skip the Farfetch trade since it's not that useful, and head back to Cerulean City to get the bike, take our Geodude out from the daycare and put Abra back in, and return to Vermilion as we finally get a Gyarados. The guide then says to go on the SSN and focus on leveling up Pikachu, Geodude, and Gyarados, but especially Gyarados. It also notes how Geodude is allergic to water types, which is just another funny terminology difference from when Pokemon was brand new. This lets us fight our rival in the SSN and get the Cut HM, which was the whole point of the guy telling us to catch Bellsprout a little bit earlier. Now that you have cut, you can chop down the tree that blocks the gym. Once inside, you can fight three electrifying trainers. Your level 18 plus Geodude should head the pack. Now you have to solve a tiny puzzle. First, search all of the trash cans. One will contain a switch, random each time you play. Search the one to the right hand side of it to find another switch. With both switches activated, the electric door will slide open, revealing Lieutenant Surge. Gyarados dies after three thunder attacks, so that's out of the question. Thunder is Gyarados' only weakness. Surprisingly, Lieutenant Surge's electrical Pokemon barely phase War Turtle, which I find disturbing since battle charts across the internet say that electric beats water no matter what. A single Bubble Beam will probably kill Voltorb and Pikachu in one shot. However, the best way to take these guys down is to use your level 18 plus Geodude since a thunder attack will cause almost no damage to him at all, or actually it'll cause no damage at all. 
uses Dig Attack for a one-hit KO, and Rock Toss is also very powerful. If you didn't get a Geodude and teach it TM Dig, then go to Diglett's Cavern and catch a Diglett, since they automatically come with Dig and are immune to lightning attacks. Geodude was a great call here, although getting a Diglett was probably just easier since they're already a pretty high level when you first catch them. Either way, they make Surge go by in two shakes of a lamb's tail since our Geodude evolved into Graveler, allowing us to move on to the section on the Rainbow Badge. The first place it wants us to visit is the Diglett's Tunnel. It doesn't say much about it, then for the other side of the tunnel, it mentions the trade you can do to give your Abra for a Mr. Mime. They go on to say, it's a fair trade, I suppose. I never was a big fan of Psychic Pokemon though, so I usually dump him in the PC and forget about him. In case you didn't know, in Generation 1, Psychic types were the best types in the game, as the type advantage chart was a bit different back then, Dark type didn't exist yet, and there were barely any Bug type moves to even hit Psychic type Pokemon. It then says to pick up the Flash HM to return to Vermilion City, cut back to Cerulean City, and head east for Route 9. It doesn't say much for Route 9 aside to fight all the trainers along this route, then teach Flash to Pikachu or Drowsy for the Rock Tunnel. It made no mention of Drowsy earlier, and while I can just look later in the guide to see where to find it, I just taught Flash to Pikachu and went into the tunnel. The guide doesn't say too much about Rock Tunnel either, aside from saying that War Turtle will be good here for the Rock-type Pokemon, then once on the other side, we quickly cross Route 10 and into Lavender Town. There's not much for us to do here right now, so the guide wants us to continue west, not south, through Route 8, and it says to catch a Growlithe or Vulpix, especially if you don't have a Gyarados, and continue along to Celadon City. We have a Gyarados, but I caught one anyway, just in case. The guide details everything in Celadon City, starting with the game corner and the prizes, saying how the prize Pokemon can be obtained elsewhere except for Porygon, which sucks anyway and that we can pick up the optional Eevee, but it doesn't put too much of an emphasis on that. Now, for the gym. There are five basic scenarios for you to take on this gym leader. One, you chose Charmander at the start of the game, and you wipe the floor with her grass Pokemon by using powerful fire attacks. Two, you followed my sacred advice and got a Gyarados, and you use Body Slam slash Bite to kill them in one or two hits, depending on your levels. Three, you didn't choose Charmander and you didn't follow my advice for some reason, and you got a Growlithe slash Vulpix instead, then use their fire attacks to hurt her grass Pokemon. Four, a combination of all of the above. Five, you didn't do any of this and they kill your pathetic excuses for a team in less than five turns. Luckily for us, we listened to the guide as that's kind of the whole point of this video, so we have a Gyarados for Erika with Body Slam to take care of her pretty easily. After the fight against Erika's gym, the guide chose the suggested main team we should have, all of which are Pokemon we have on our team right now, and our levels are pretty close, except for our War Turtle which is only level 28, while its suggested level is level 34. We also have an extra Vulpix on the team, but I don't think we'll be needing it anymore. Next starts the section for collecting the Marsh Badge, starting with the Game Corner Basement. The guide gives us a step-by-step -step walkthrough to navigate to the Lift Key to find Giovanni, suggesting we use War Turtle and Gyarados in this fight mostly. After the fight, Giovanni runs off quickly, promising to see you again, and drops the Sylv Scope, which allows you to locate ghosts in Pokemon Tower. Where's that, you ask? Remember, Lavender Town? In the Lavender Tower, we fight Gary first, and abuse Gyarados, of course. Then it explains how Ghastly is a good Pokemon to have, and to switch train it since it's immune to so many attacks, being a ghost-type Pokemon. Then after reaching the top of the tower, it says, After defeating them, you should have Haunter, Blastoise, and a Graveler. If you don't have them slash very close to it, you're not fighting enough trainers. I've been trying to fight every single trainer in our path to keep up with this guide, and Ghastly and War Turtle do evolve in the tower, but I am still a few levels below what the guide is suggesting. Then it says to head east of Lavender Town to give the guard a fresh water so he can pass, although they must have meant head east of Celadon City or maybe head west of Lavender Town, since those are two ways to get to Saffron City from here. Minor mistake, trust me, I know, I make a ton. And once in Saffron City, it says how we can easily go north and check out the Abra and the Daycare that we left, which is a much higher level now. After that, it says we can fight the Fighting Dojo, and of course, suggests Gyarados and Blastoise, and another dirty trick we can use here is use our Haunter. Now, for the Sylph Building, the big building in the center of town. The guide tells us exactly where we need to go to find Gary, and says to use the same strategy for this fight against him as we did in the previous one in Lavender Tower, so we use Pikachu on his lead bird, then Gyarados or Blastoise for the rest, then get a Lapras as a reward and fight Giovanni. I hate to say this after making such a big deal of the fight, but use the same strategy as last time. Basically, water kills them all easily, tongue out face. I told you that Squirtle was the best thing to pick at the start, but no one believed me. 
After that we get a Master Ball, and that takes care of the Sylph building with our next task being the fight against Sabrina, the Teenage Witch. Not really, but close to it. Sabrina was pretty popular in the 90s, and I never thought of it until now, but I wonder if Sabrina the Teenage Witch had any inspiration for Sabrina's name in the English games. It also has us battle the gyms slightly out of order since Sabrina is technically the 6th gym while Koga is the 5th gym leader, but their levels are pretty close anyway so it doesn't matter too much. With the way the game flows, it's easy to think that Sabrina should be the next gym too since you're already in her town and after beating the Sylph building you just open up her gym. For the fight against Sabrina, we have a paragraph saying, Okay, that's it. I just have to say something right about now. Have you noticed that all of the women gym-like trainers have been a little, well, practically naked? I mean, for crying out loud, this is a Nintendo-made game. This gal has a mini skirt, about 3 square inches for a shirt, and, get this, a leather whip. And they say Nintendo censors everything, tongue out face. Now I will revert back to my FAQ writing. I just had to mention it because that's what I'm famous for, being a pervert. But I'm a nice guy, really. Then as you can probably imagine, the guide recommends Gyarados for Sabrina's Pokemon, but also our recently acquired Haunter, which is pretty good here too, much like what Ash did in the original anime when he fought Sabrina. Now for the next badge, we need to go to Fuchsia City, and there's two ways to get there outlined by the guide. We have a lot of battles here, and ladies and gentlemen, this is what the guide calls a lot of trainers. We level up a nice bit here and arrive in Fuchsia City. The first place the guide wants us to go to here is the Safari Zone, where it outlines all the Pokemon we can catch here, as well as the Gold Teeth and the Surf HM we need to get here. It then says that Hydro Pump is just a weaker Surf, which isn't exactly accurate. We can also give the Gold Teeth we got to the Warden in exchange for the Strength HM, which we have to teach to Graveler, then fight Koga's Poison-type Gym. For the fight, the guide says, These are pretty tame Pokemon if you ask me. Blastoise can kill them with a single Bubble Beam slash Hydro Pump, as can Gyarados with Surf. Graveler can also do one-hit kills with Earthquake and Dig, depending on your levels. It, again, really likes Gyarados, but this works out for us. I was a bit surprised it's just Graveler first to begin with because we are fighting Poison Pokemon after all, but I guess Gyarados is just that good. This gives us the Soul Badge, and the Soul Badge makes your Pokemon more powerful, lets your abilities increase, makes you one step closer to a Pokemon League HQ. Heck, it even does your taxes for you, if it feels like it, tongue out face. After the fight, it shows what levels our Pokemon should be, and we're really close to that again. I still don't know how the Guide Rider managed to get these levels on us since I battled every trainer in sight too, but it shouldn't be too much of a problem. Next up is the Volcano Badge, and the Guide has a notice saying, Right now would be a pretty good time to build up your main Pokemon, Gyarados, Blastoise, Alakazam, whatever else you prefer, to over level 50. At level 52, Blastoise learns Hydro Pump, the most powerful water attack, and Gyarados learns Hyper Beam, the most powerful attack, period. I will point out some good areas to teach them in. Also, go get the two legendary birds, Articuno and Zapdos. Zapdos is the best electric Pokemon in the game, while Articuno is the best ice, and can kill some very important enemy Pokemon when you get to the end of the game. See the optional area section for more information. Even though the birds are optional, and I tend to forego a lot of optional things in these videos, let's go check them out so we can say we played the game as closely as possible to this random game facts guide from 1999 that was probably made by some teenager who just loved video games. For Zapdos, we need to go to the power plant, and for catching it, the guide says, If you follow my walkthrough, you will have a level 30 plus Graveler and a level 35 plus Haunter. First, use Graveler's rock attacks to wear Zapdos down, then switch to another weak Pokemon and let it die. Then, replace it with your Haunter. Haunter can be killed in one shot, so bring lots of revives. This is why I use the weak Pokemon. If you change to another Pokemon mid-battle, it counts as a turn, unless it's dead. You know what I'm saying? Use Hypnosis to put Zapdos to sleep. The lower the HP, the better the chances. Then use Lick, which causes almost no damage, to lower its health to almost nothing. While Zapdos is still asleep, throw an Ultra Ball, use the Pokeball trick to make your chances better, and you will capture it. It took a few attempts because I kept missing Hypnosis and dying with Haunter, but now for Articuno, we need to head to the Seafoam Islands and through this annoying cave by pushing all of these boulders around, then use the same strategy we used as Zapdos to catch Articuno. For Cinnabar Island, it outlines the Fossil Research Lab, calls Aerodactyl a Dragon-type probably because of Lance, then highlights the Pokemon Mansion. It tells us to build up our Gyarados and Blastoise in here to get the key to open the gym, and even tells us a step-by-step -step directions on where to go. Then, for the gym against Blaine, you guessed it, it suggests Blastoise and Gyarados for Blaine's Fire-type Pokemon, along with Zapdos and Graveler, which are also solid options too, for our 7th gym badge. All that leaves now is one gym badge back in Viridian City against Giovanni. Could this possibly be any easier? Blastoise can take all of the Pokemon down with a single Bubble Beam or Hydro Pump if needed. 
If you didn't get scored off the start, get a Starmie from the Seafoam Islands and teach it Bubble Beam. Our trusty Blastoise bails us out again for the 8th Gym Badge. Then it says, Now, for the east side of Iridian City is a path that leads to the Pokemon League headquarters. You will fight Gary, but he is so pathetic, so I won't bother writing up any strategy. As you go through, you will need to show your badges to the guards. At the end, you will find the Victory Road. And you know what, Marshmallow? Gary is pathetic, so I won't even bother showing this fight in the video. For the Victory Road, the guy notes how it's an annoying cave and how we can get Moltres here, but we can skip it since there's better Fire-type Pokemon, although we're at the tail end of the game and have no Fire-types, so I don't know what other Fire-types we could even get after this point. Now for the Indigo Plateau. This is the last area before you fight the Elite Four. It contains a Poke Center and a Pokemart. Buy about three or four revives, some max slash hyper potions, and make sure to have the Poke Flute in case one of your Pokemon falls asleep. And well, that's all you should need. You will be forced to fight the Elite Four consecutively, meaning you cannot go back to heal. There's not much more to say, so let's get ready to rumble. We have the exact team of six the guide suggests headed into the fight against Lorelei. For Lorelei, it says she mainly uses water Pokemon. Water is severely allergic to lightning, which means your Zapdos can use Thunder and kill them in about one hit. If you can't get Zapdos, Raichu slash Jolteon is a very good choice as well. Besides that though, there's really not much of anything that will hurt them a whole lot. The second fight is a muscular man named Bruno. Bruno likes rock and fighting Pokemon the best. The two Onyxes and the Machamp can be easily killed by your Blastoise. Use Hydro Pump on Machamp only, as Bubble Beam or even Water Gun kills the Onyx in one shot. If you can't get Blastoise, try a Lapras, Vaporeon, or a Starmie. For the Hitmonchan slash Lee, screw them up by using Confuse Ray, Dream Eater, and Nightshade courtesy of your Haunter. If you didn't get a Haunter, an Alakazam slash Kadabra does well, as do other Psychics like Hypno and Mr. Mime. When you get Mewtwo, there's no competition. Blastoise pretty much handled the whole team by itself, leading us to an old lady known as Agatha. Agatha strikes hard with her assortment of ghost and poison Pokemon. Very tricky. Gengar can confuse you and put you to sleep. Use the Poke Flute. Very few attacks come in contact with ghosts, so you'll need to try out different kinds. Your best bet is Gyarados' Dragon Rage or Blastoise's Hydro Pump. Arbok falls prey to just about anything, it being poison. Psychics work very, very well here. That last line is kind of interesting because I feel like as the guide progresses, they kind of switched up on psychic types as they first said they weren't very good. But to be fair, it did suggest Alakazam for the Elite Four as a backup option, probably just because of Agatha. We follow suit with Blastoise again though, then make it to the most powerful of the Elite Four, known worldwide as Lance. Lance is the most difficult trainer you have fought thus far, as he trains the most powerful of any Pokemon types, Dragons. The only ones that can be killed easily would be a pair of Dragonairs, the rest are very potent and know the most devastating attacks in the game, Hyper Beam, which is a one-hit KO almost every time. Only your most sturdy Pokemon will be able to withstand it. To fight back, use your Articuno. Ice is the only type that can easily defeat Dragon. One or two hits with Ice Beam or Blizzard will put them down. If you don't have Articuno, use your Haunter for some good effects. And you should have taught Blizzard to your Blastoise. For his first one, Gyarados, use Zapdos since Gyarados is allergic to lightning. He is not a true dragon type. The rest will die in one ice beam. You have won! Well, practically, it seems that Gary has been the Elite Four already, which means you're not done by a long shot. The most powerful trainer in the entire world, Gary. Here is a step-by-step -step strategy on how to kill his Pokemon. Pidgeot. Zapdos, Raichu, or Jolteon will be able to take care of his pest within a few turns. No biggie. Alakazam, the most powerful psychic Pokemon you could have seen so far. This one knows all kinds of evil moves. Your best bet will be Hyper Beam from your Gyarados or several Hydro Pumps from your Blastoise. Rhydon, the easiest without a doubt. Use Hydro Pump, Blizzard, Bubble Beam, or any other water-based attack to bring this rock Pokemon down in little time. Grass also does well. The Pokemon you face after depends on what Pokemon you chose at the start of the game. Here's a list of all the Pokemon you might face, including strategies, of course. Gyarados. Zapdos can kill this in one or two shots. Watch out, this guy knows Hyper Beam again. Raichu or Jolteon works well too. Arcanine slash Charizard. Were you wondering when your Graveler would be of assistance? Ask no longer. Mine just fainted when I sent it in because it was a pretty low level, so I just used Blastoise for Arcanine. Executor slash Venusaur. These will appear if you chose Squirtle, like I told you to. Blizzard from Blastoise slash Articuno can take them down in one shot, as can Hyper Beam, which you should have saved, from Gyarados, would also have done the trick. 
We used Articuno on his last Pokemon Venusaur, but with that, we beat Pokemon Red and Blue according to this nearly 25-year-old guide written by some random person on the internet. It closes out by saying, Congratulations, you are now the most powerful Pokemon collector in the world. However, don't make the fatal mistake of thinking the game is over. No, no, no. You still have to get 150 Pokemon. The following sections will show you how, or at least give you some help. You can also fight the Elite Four over and over, racking up tons of EXP and cash. Unfortunately for me, I don't have any friends with a Game Boy, so I will never get 150. Oh well, I have Game Shark, tongue sticking out face, even if it's Satan. The rest of the guide then goes over more optional areas and how to catch some of the rarer Pokemon, but overall, this was the most fun guide we've looked at so far. It almost felt like I was transported back into the 90s to play Pokemon when this game first came out. This guide had its own unique charm, since it was just written by some huge Pokemon fan in their spare time, and wasn't written by some big publication sold worldwide like some other guides we've looked at before. Something about internet relics like this from the late 90s and early 2000s are so fun to look at just to see how far the internet has come. Like, back in 1999, it wasn't feasible to make internet videos like this on Pokemon like you're watching right now, and I'm sure if I was born about a decade earlier, I probably would have been on GameFAQs like Marshmallow contributing to these guides, and playing a lot more video games. I tried contacting Marshmallow, who wrote this guide, to ask them some questions on their guide, but the email listed in the guide is no longer in service, and they haven't logged into their GameFAQs account in a few years now, so I have no idea what they're up to now. If you're somehow watching this Marshmallow, thank you so much for making this awesome guide, and I would love to know if you're still into games today, especially Pokemon. If you enjoyed this video, consider leaving a like and subscribing, as it was a ton of fun to make, and if you enjoyed this video, I'm sure you'll also enjoy some of my other videos, like these ones that'll appear at the end screen in a few seconds. With all that out of the way, thank you so much for watching, have a great rest of your day, I'll see y'all next time, and bye bye.